Thank you for clicking play. This is PK of the PK comic book 411. The long-awaited others, the other publishers, the non-big two, the non-DC, non-Marvel. We have Image and Dynamite, and boom. So, lightning round, less recommendations and reviews, and more associations and connections. Um, as you can see, I'm wearing my Tokyo Ghost t-shirt, got lead dent, and might as well start off with Rick Remender, Tokyo Ghost number six. Lead dent is now back being a badass, and in this particular one, Remender is going over some uh, political stances and some idiocracy, which is the Mike Judge film. Remender also writes Black Science. Remender always talks about family and weird situations, and I was introduced to Remender by his Captain America Dimension Z, which artwork gave me a headache. Um, actually, all of his artwork is very much angular and scratchy. On to Low, which I was saving up, and it was really Tokyo Ghost that, that got me to start reading Low again. Um, so rifling through, number four um, really introduces something called quantumology, which is sort of self-fulfilling prophecy that if you really think good things are going to happen, but then when you really think good things and nothing really happens and you get twisted on that religion, if you will. Um, one of the um, quotes is, uh, consciousness determines the design of the universe. Uh, number eight. We have a new colors comes in and that those angles type of art is a little bit um, smoothed out, I should say. It's less on the headache. <laughs> Need to point out that uh, Remender said that this took five times longer to uh, write number 10 because of his family issues. And as he was going through uh, the mother's um, sort of self realization that he had to do that himself. So that's a number 10. It's a seminal issue for him. It was very cathartic. He mentions that in the back. Again, I don't like to do spoilers. In number 12, they finally get to the surface. No spoilers. They finally get to the surface, quite honestly. That should lead into Autumn Lands, which is one of my favorite gems, but we're going to get to that later. All right, so that's Rick Remender, um, Black Science, Low, and of course, Tokyo Ghost. Now, to the left of me, you should see Thunderbolt, which is very Rob Liefeld-esque type of art. And you have Jim Zub, the writer. Now, when I saw Jim Zub, I'm like, oh my God. Talking about other publishers, Dynamite with Paizo does Pathfinder. Pathfinder was a way when, when you played D&D, pen and paper D&D, back in the ages, in the 80s, you always wanted a computer game to be like D&D. Then the computer games almost got to D&D, and then D&D turned into what the computer games were, third and fourth edition. We didn't like that, so then Pathfinder was made to actually say, okay, this is the true D&D back in the day. There was a jet flying overhead, how cool is that? So, watch this. Jim Zub is the brain of all of these. Pathfinder hardcovers and the size of actual D&D, you know, RPGs um, of the DMG, Dungeon Master's Guide, and the PH, all those. This is the size, so it's a, with all of my RPG hardcovers. The wonderful thing that they did was when they started Pathfinder, they decided to make iconic characters. That means like you have your quintessential cleric and your fighter and your dwarf, etc. So they have the iconic characters here with Maricel, Ezrin, Harsk, Kira, Valera, in the back of these, God, I wonder if I was a DM these days. You have the map of the particular hardcover, and even better, if you're a GM DM, you have all of the backstory. Not only that, you have all of the XP, you have the HP, it's whatever you just read, you can actually put into your game. So not only are you reading, the actual stories of the iconic characters. But in the end, you can actually take those and uh, make your own game with it. Volume one, Dark Water Rising. Volume two, you have Of Tooth and Claw. Volume three, you have City of Secrets. Long way away, it's City of Secrets. Again, this is all Jim Zub, who's now writing. Thunderbolts, and now they have the spin-off of Volume 1 of Goblins, and these are a collection of Goblin Tales, and the Goblins in there are always rhyming and being funny, etc. So as I said, this looks like Rob Liefeld. Um, did you actually realize that in an uh, Outcast TV show that premiered two days ago, 
There is um, Youngblood, Rob Liefeld's Youngblood, in the back left corner of Kyle Barnes's room. Such an odd choice for a Kirkman. So we have Outcast uh, number 16. Um, and Outcast as a comic is one of the quickest damn reads, slow moving, but quickest reads. Um, sort of frustrating, but to me, it's a screenplay. And even the insert panels, like, you know, you're looking at a watch, etc., that's like what they call inserts or cut ins in, um, in filmmaking. This is actually 17, and they start to reveal what the merge is. Now, on the TV show, they must have put like the first four issues together because they had the merge, they had the breath thing going on. Um, so that slow-moving comic was then condensed in a wonderful episode. And I have to say, it was better than Preacher, but should not have been. Before I go on to that, this is the four-story arc ends in number 18. And I gotta tell you, I couldn't tell you what, what story arc was what. But Kirkman ends the fourth one with this. Uh, again, a slow reveal. And in the back of this, it, it, last, it lists all of the actors. And I was glad to see the rib guy from House of Cards, Netflix original, Kevin Spacey, Claire Underwood, Princess Buttercup, etc. cetera. Um, the rib guy is one of the cops in Outcast. Hopefully you connected those two. So, Preacher, yes, this is book one. I have book two to read. And uh, Seth Rogen is in the spirit of Garth Ennis. They kept on saying we wanted to be true to Garth Ennis. It's true to Garth Ennis. It's certainly not true to Garth Ennis's layout, his pacing. They're introducing characters that are in the spirit of Garth Ennis. I flipped through book one after I saw the pilot, and I like the reveal. I like how the three of them met much better, but hey, at least it's on TV. You gotta be happy about that, right? Okay, so those are the two TV premieres that just happened as comics move to the big screen. Now we're gonna go back to fantasy. We have Joshua Williamson and Birthright. Can't say enough about this. Um, this particular issue, 14, has the brotherly spat. We have issue 15, very, very packed issue. Has an ending twist at the end. Fathers, sons, brothers fighting. Joshua Williamson also writes Ghosted. He also writes Nailbiter. And there's going to be another one that's going to come to me. Birthright always goes together with Autumn Lands. Now, remember how I said in uh, Low, when they reached the surface, something very, very odd happened, um, very cartoony? Well, that's way in the future with bipedal creatures, rats, dogs, all those. And they're casting magic. So magic has returned, but they call in the savior, which is a laser soldier human uh, from the human's past. And in this, they apologize for being late, holiday printing schedule issues, etc. So we have Autumn Lamb coming back in full force. It's my gem, people. Autumn Land is my gem. Whenever it comes out, I'm very, very excited uh, to read it. With the animals talking, <laughs> we have Monstrous. Another one, uh, Marjorie Louis who also is featured in the Image Plus magazine that came out, the free one for now. I guess it's gonna be $1.99, $2.99 pretty soon. Monstrous, it is so beautiful, mystical, dark and deep, rich history, almost past food feedings, force feeding. Like there's so many names and places I feel like I should be taking notes, but Monstrous, um, geez, it's, it's from Image. It's wonderful, the art, I, I can't believe they're even on time. The art is so intricate they now have put since issue two there's a six tail professor cat at the end sort of explaining things so it gets you up to speed on this faction this area this this sect etc uh going against each other and what happened so um another engrossing world as well as autumn lands which used to be called tooth and claw but there was a copyright issue notice how i ran, ran out of bags and boards and that is because i have switched to the kind that has the sticky at the end Really liking that. How much do you hate when you go through a few files and you have that goddamn one corner that's up? All right, so we have Manifest Destiny, which is about Lewis and Clark's expedition, but it's very fantastical. Anyway, this starts the part one of six, which is the Sasquatch, which is obviously Bigfoot. Um, that's Chris Dingus, or Dingus. Um, along with the fantastical, we have Stepan Sedgic, our favorite Croatian. Uh, with thyroid problems, which I have as well. Um, we have number three of Switch, which is set in the Switchblade um, universe. Um, it's the new Death Vigil, if you will. And Death Vigil is now collected, all of them. I think it's one through nine, one through eight. 
he does everything. He, do, he does the lettering, he does the art, he does the writing. Uh, I've talked about this plenty of times. Now we're gonna go into space. Aki Moreni. Matt Kent, I think, is a very solid storyteller. Valiant, to me, is Joshua Dysart doing Bloodshot. It's Swin Dwayne Swernzerski doing Harbinger. And then you have Fred Van Lent, who took over Big Trouble in Little China. Awful. But he did Archer and Armstrong. So that's the beginning of Valiant to me. That was the relaunch. But then when it got to after Armor Hunters and they did the Valiant and all that stuff, it's really Jeff Lemire and Matt Kent. Matt Kent is sort of the ruler of, of uh, the Valiant universe, like Jeff Johns is to DC or Hickman was to Marvel, which may be Nick Spencer now with Standoff. He turned me around on this. That's the reason why I'm telling you all this. Ride number one was sort of a continuation from his Unity number two. Unity number two was named Silk, and that introduced Silk sort of in our present day. Then let's go up 2,000 years, and you have Silk um, being one of the characters in Ride. And this exploded into so many different characters. It was a fast read to me because of time, but it was succinct. And it was, it, and Clayton Crane, God, God love Clayton Crane, who also did Savior, which was Todd McFarlane. And he actually did number two of Eternal Warrior. Yes, the issue number two is the first time I saw uh, Clayton Crane's. Just so you know, if you're a Clayton Crane fan, issue number two of Eternal Warrior was Clayton Crane. Eternal Warrior is being was written by Greg Pack. Greg Pack, Matt Kent. Same type of writers. Very solid story writers, not prophetic, not prolific. Well, I guess they are prolific. Just not prophetic and not something I can really chew or recommend. It's a story that I read. Okay, that's good. Put it away. Again, changed everything in Ryan number two. Um, there is a Reddit Valiant reading order. That's why I have not read um, volume number three. And just so you know, Valiant is going to a 4001 AD. That's going to be their next crossover, which is after Armor Hunters. And the one before that was Harbinger Wars, which is my favorite. Again, Dice Art and School of the It just so happens, though, that in here, they have polytronic AIs. And when you're uh, a human, um, you get one attached to you and your best friends and you learn together, which incredibly is exactly like Matt Hawkins' symmetry. Now, I really want to know which came first, <laughs> exactly what Matt Kent did, exactly, with the Positronic thing and matched up. Um, I don't particularly like that, but Matt Hawkins is one of those ones that, in the last four pages, does all of his research. So maybe he took what Matt Kent did, and now he's really delving into it. Um, symmetry number two, uh, it's extremely cerebral thought experiment about when everything is copacetic and they're all that there is is peace and again by an AI that controls everything very similar I want, I want you to understand how similar it is so this is number three of a four issue arc um, and the AI is not necessarily the villain it really isn't it's trying to do you know Isaac Asimov's best way of helping the humans um, again the last four pages Robots are self-aware now, and he really goes into the four pillars of symmetry, sticking with space. This is Mass Effect meets Game of Thrones. It's, it's in the Honorverse, and it's by the author, author David Weber, who has over 30 novels, and then other authors started writing in the Honorverse. I mean, it puts George R.R. R. Martin to shame. I could not believe when I was uh, investigating this, how much? Now this is Hawkins, which is the same thing as uh, Top Cow Symmetry, so, okay? So this guy used to write this and they had huge plans. They had a game on the, uh, on the cell phone. The art in this is jaw-dropping. So this is, um, okay, hold on. This is Bread to Kill, which is the second, and it's supposed to be like a third, fourth, fifth. There's all of this timeline. And Bread to Kill, zero, one, two, three. See the bread to kill here, just so you know. Story and pace moves along briskly, but it's so good as empowered female uh, protagonist. Uh, real conclusion here, he didn't screw it up because again, it's based on these novels. And then, on Basilisk Station, which takes like novel one and novel four, there's flashbacks between it. And this is Jean Jun Yoon. And then it changed to Sang Il Jean. Now I didn't know this is distance, 
difference between the two artists. I'm telling you, it's jaw-dropping. It's like looking at um, a very well-rendered video game with a wonderful Mass Effect and Game of Thrones put together. A couple of trades here. Jeff Lemire, Descender. It's a family-oriented AI looking, you see the theme here with all the AI in space, uh, looking for his family, touching, and the character development of the robots is his prize. It's amazing how we care about Driller, okay? <laughs> I mean, we love that guy, right? Um, and Tim 21 meets Tim 22. You don't know about Tim 22, but the character development of artificial intelligence robots Jeff Lemire hits on the nail. Sticking with space, we have Monadic. Now, not too many people know about this. It's Marechi, and it's from the Roche Limit trilogy. So there's a V1, one through six, and then V2. Awful, that's an Aliens remake, Alien 2 remake. Bill Paxton did it better. Lynch per her charge. She survived here without food, weapons, or ammo. So this is volume three, and it's the good thing that they brought back the, st the stars, the protagonists of volume one. If you're gonna check out Rose Limit, get volume one, you're gonna like it. It's gonna be hard the first couple issues, by the end of it, you're gonna like it. This is one through, don't you hate it? That's why we love Valiant people. I would have been able to look at this and just tell you how many. One through, oh my God. As if I can read that even with my glasses. All right, anyway, Roche Limit, by the way, two definitions. Roche limit, if you have two orbiting bodies, when it gets to a certain uh, orbit, a certain circle, then the actual planet here will start deteriorating and going into the central planet of the two uh, planets involved. So Roche limit is that actual limit that this one breaks down and starts becoming fragments and goes to the center body. Monadic is actually a step-by-step -step function of the least broken down components of said structure. So it's the basic block unit, which is the monad. So monadic is that step-by-step -step function of the least block unit. Very Matrix-esque. It's a self, so the, uh, the aliens from two that were sort of discovered in one love the human's self-consciousness spirituality, self-awareness, um, and they want it, but the sacrifice they don't get when the humans sacrifice something for another, like, the two, well, I, I don't get it. So that's what they're exploring here. Um, again, if you're gonna give it a shot, just do volume one and take it from there. From the minds of BPRD, hopefully I said that, BPCRD, Hellboy, etc. Arcudi, this is, you have a normal guy finding about mythos within our everyday lives. You have the backstory, you have the fights, you're rooting for a scarecrow, of all things, of him trying to get back his heart, literally. Uh, and you have a Loki-esque character. This is something you should check out if you haven't heard it. You have Rumble, V1, and V2. I just thought he was gonna run out of ideas in V2, but he continues and it's an engrossing world. And you are, do you get laughs? You get laughs in this, um, but it's more kooky, okay? Now, speaking of kooky, they got the same eyes. Nothing to do with it. They got the same eyes. This is the Joe Harris Marazzo team, and they brought us Chaz Worthington the third of Great Pacific. Great Pacific is based off of the garbage island that is in the middle of the Pacific, that the, the currents, the swells, basically bring all of it together. And of course, in V1, he just, hey, this is mine. He's a rich kid, right? And I don't want to be rich anymore, whatever. So I'm going to go there. This land is mine. And then here he is on the pile of his island of trash in the mid-Pacific. And uh, of course, it ends up to be more political um, because now he's trying to stake his claim to it. Um, and you have, uh, obviously, like, seagulls with two heads and all of these mutations. But, back to Snowfall, which is different than Snowblind. Um, this is when weather is a weapon. So, 
These guys are sort of the eco-themed comic guys. This, the Joe Harris, Martin Marazzo. And uh, there's the last winter wizard. And he's the one that can bring in snow, but there hasn't been snow forever. And so there's a political force, like a police state, that goes after the, the weather people. Moving on to fun stuff, we have Scotty Young, which is raised on Mad Magazine. And this is the end of the first arc. Laugh out loud for real moments. L-O-L-L-F-R. Literally page churning ahas when you go through this this wonderful tale of a dickhead kid and, and storyland. Uh, along with those lines, we have Ryan Otley doing his Grizzly Shark. He came from Grizzly Shark, and I forget the other one, but they decided to do Grizzly Shark first. Um, this is fun. It's funny. It's comic. It's a real comic. It's comic clone. Real definition. Um, any more than 350 would be worth it. Getting to a more Still, still funny, but um, serious note. This, and I think this is a mini of four. Four may be out already. What they did, Fieri, I think is how you pronounce his name. He took the species of the animal and things like whether throwing ball in a jail. Some guys get to play. Some guys don't get to play. They're in jail, you know, who's with who and who's the ruler of who. But he did it to the specific breed of a canine or the cats being like, you know, they're, well, there's a picture of the, the cats ruling the roost, if you will, because cats are inherently evil. I think we all know that. <laughs> so, you know, you have death row and a pound that is euthanizing this. The parallels that he does between feline and canine and, and our jail system. Uncanny, it's four issues. Boom, Boom Studios, this is, get the trade, how about that? By the way, Joshua Williamson, that I talked about, also writes Illuminati. I bring that up because James Robinson, he's prolific, he's written a lot. Airboy, he was put in charge of by the COO, I think, of Image, didn't have the idea, went to San Francisco with the artist, had a fear and loathing time in San Francisco. And it, I got the hardcover, so glad I read it. It's expensive, it's at 25. This is something I got like, some guys are like, dude, you read comics? Dude, here's Airboy, <laughs> okay? That's all I'm gonna say about that. Here's Airboy, talk to me about comics later on. Now we're gonna get some heavy hitters. I need to move on fast. We have, we have Nick Spencer, The Fix. I'm gonna say, just get it. It's evil incarnate in a way that you did not see coming in number two, um, which is not as wonderful as number one, which had so much dialogue, it was amazing how much it flowed and how the art was still there. Is this something that you should have heard of? If you haven't, you need to at least pick up number one of the fix. The beauty, uh, number six, it is now uh, the end of the arc until May, so I waited until this to tell you about it. STD that makes you beautiful. Now you know what happens in here. So you know the end story in number six, but in number seven, they're gonna go back before they knew what happens. I think that's ingenious. They have a lot to tell. So now they're gonna go through different characters like, well, you know what? If I'm gonna change the way I look to be totally beautiful, what can I do now before that happens? It'd be sort of fun to see someone start at number seven and then go back and read it. That'd be interesting. Interesting thought experiment. Peter Milligan. Peter Milligan was brought in to save uh, Justin Jordan's um, Shadow Man in Valiant. And it got so bad that they brought in Peter Milligan. Four, this is five, of Peter Milligan trying to save Shadow Man from Justin Jordan right here. And that is volume three. I've said this before in a, a different blog. Peter Milligan wrote this. The winner of this isn't your normal hack and slash winner. So Peter Milligan then got onto my good list, a Brit, uh, British writer. So Peter Milligan then writes, dude, what the fuck did I put it? Um, the, dis the discipline, this is really odd. It's very erotic, but in a very odd way. You can see a crazy hand here, but it gets odder than that. Okay, Peter Milligan. <laughs> We got something going over there in the UK. All right, then we're going to move on to Black Road, Brian Wood. Viking as a verb, I like that. Wiki, or wike, it means bay, okay? Reykjavik is Iceland's 
capital, where all the people are, 150,000 of them. Um, that means bay, okay? So a Viking are the people that hung out in bays, and all of the, the traffic that goes along the, uh, the coast line there, they used to come out, put them out into open sea, they can't handle their stuff, then they used to take over the boat and bring it back. You know, think of that spider that comes out and brings it back. That's what a Viking is. Um, I love the fact that they use it as a verb here. It's a very predictable, sort of cool. Brian Wood, though, however, is my favorite trade of all time, as it stands now, is this. And I'm not a big foodie. And they try to say that it's all about, you know, a, a apocalyptic running man type of uh, game show. Yes, that's in there. It's more than that. And the art is so fitting. Stark. Stark, Stark. Ryan Wood. So anyway, now he's doing uh, Black Road, and I'm looking forward to the uh, second trade of Star that they are coming out now. All right, JMS, Dream Police. Finally, we get some answers in here. This is the, the action-packed one of uh, uh, issue eight. Um, and the next issue is eagerly waited, so I waited to tell you about that in issue nine. We finally get some answers, and it's a bit morbid, but it's finally JMS, one of my favorites. Read Midnight Nation. You know what? I'm waiting on my rising stars. What happened to that? Jason Aaron, Southern Bastards. We're finally back to Tubbs. We love Tubbs. And now Tubbs' daughter comes in and basically, you know, upsets and resets the town. Okay? Run them revs. I was told that Lock and Key is going to change my life. HP Lovecraftian. Um, and I bought the two Master Volume hardcovers. So we'll see. Um, I was told it's going to change my life. So there it goes. Ed Brubaker. Velvet. I still need to finish all 12 of Fade Out. Apparently the answers aren't at the end. I don't like to hear that. But trade waiting would be great on this because uh, they're not exactly on time in this image. And I really start losing everything because there's a lot of mystery and intrigue. Secret Service. Very FBI. James Bond, but a la female. Um, we all know Brian K. Bond, right? I hope one day I can sit and read all of Saga, but at this point, at 10 minutes an issue, it would probably take six hours. Um, the next issue is the last of the arc. This is a bridging issue. It was needed, but yeah. All right, and then we have 36. Um, it's a break for now. It's the end of book two or volume six. And um, in the back, we have something about Pillars of Eternity, which is a Facebook, I mean, excuse me, Kickstarter, spiritual successor of Baldur's Gate, the three quarters view game. And guess who's going to be playing that during the break? Fiona Staples, Brian K. Vaughn, Paper Girls. Trey waited on this after reading the first one. I was really excited about it. It's good. I'm not going to say it's groundbreaking. It's fun. It's empowering. Will I get volume two? Yes, because it's Brian K. Vaughn. On to a next big wig, Grant Morrison, Claws. It's a mini. It's up to seven. If, uh, if you haven't read it, it's this Grant Morrison actually writing dialogue in a story that doesn't go cray cray. So um, I would wait until the hardcover would be great of Claus, actually. And obviously, Claus is a story about Santa Claus. Uh, Santa Claus actually became Santa Claus. And in the last issue, uh, number five, the dick kid stops being a dick, which is cool. We needed that to happen. We actually understand why the villain is so villainous. Lastly, we have, oops, two more. Uh, Warren Ellis who's good with his, his horror. This is a Black Cross from the pages of Project Superpowers, which is a pretty cool team, um, sort of macabre team of superheroes. Um, and I did not know anything about Project Superpowers, so I just got this. It was a fun read. I'm not saying it, it wasn't. Um, I just didn't really know what was going on. It was a uh, crime thriller novel horror. Lastly, we have Jonathan Hickman. East of West Back, number 25, always great read. Nick Dragota, God, prolific is all hell out. I mean, it's just wonderful. Um, the art is impeccable, always. But I lead into Jonathan Hickman's God is Dead that was taken over by Mott Costa, which I believe is over at Boundless now. Okay, this is 46. My God, why am I still buying it? It's a $4 drain. Then we have this art. So in God, of God is Dead by Avatar Press. It's interesting in the back, you see all of the... Um, advertisements. You have Kieran Gillen, who's done Vader and Iron Man, 
Um, He's doing Mercury, Heat, and Cross, okay? And then you have Garth Ennis, who does Preacher, is doing Code Prue. And then you have Acosta, which is going to do Web Warriors. Um, it's interesting how many people are doing Avatar Press. Anyway, God is that Jonathan Hickman has nothing to do with it by now. And then we finally have the last issue, final issue, whatever. God, all 48, I have it. And Here's another one you can drop, Asylum. It was so beautiful in the beginning, and it's done by Sandy King, which is John Carpenter's wife. Escape from New York, gotta love it. It's now unpatriotic. At least 35 minutes, right? Hopefully you like the music. That was me.